Hello everyone, to another episode of Quiet the Elk. In this episode, I'm going to be reading excerpts from the unofficial Harry Potter cookbook. I really hope you enjoy it. So as I'm reading to you again, like always, just sit back and relax. Concentrate on the sound of my voice. and If you fall asleep, well, then that's great. Forward, a feast of food and words. Harry Potter's first taste of Hogwarts, as it were, is an eye-opener. While the Dursleys did not completely neglect to feed Harry, they never allowed him to eat as much as he wanted. So at his first Hogwarts feast, for the first time in his short life, he is allowed to eat as much as he likes. Each school year at Hogwarts begins with a celebratory meal in its cavernous Great Hall. No doubt these magnificent meals left an indelible impression on a young Harry, who hungered for more when living with his muggle relatives. A feeling of kinship and of family that he clearly lacked. A desire to know his clouded past, which had been carefully and deliberately hidden from him at all costs, by his deliptuous uncle and aunt, the detestable Dursleys, and most of all, a desire to realize who he truly is, living in two diametrically opposed worlds, the unimaginative mogul world and the enchanting world of wizards, his true home. Though we muggles will never get to taste life in the wizarding world, we must console ourselves with sampling the food Rowling writes about so lovingly. In her seven novels, food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks plays an important part. An essential ingredient that helps complete our picture of life at Hogwarts. That's especially true for American readers who are largely more familiar with Big Macs and fries and McDonald's than with traditional British cuisine. Black pudding, crumpets, spotted dick, kippers, steak and kidney pie, trifles, and other dishes. Fortunately, we Americans do share a commonality with some of the foods mentioned in Rowling's novels and this delightful cookbook. First on that list, ice cream, which of course is universally loved and needs no explanation to Americans. Candy, too, is a universal favorite, though wizards get to enjoy confections not available to muggles. Jelly slugs, fizzing whizbies, and fudge flies, to name a few. Rowling's mouth-watering dishes, desserts, and candies are left to our imaginations, hungry for more information about their appearance and taste. The Muggle-created versions, to be sold at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and Universal Orlando Resort, are the closest we'll get to actually enjoying them. But for those of us not lucky enough to travel to Florida, what's left to savor? Traditional British cuisine, which is the subject of this marvelous book, by Dinah Buchholz, who serves up an enticing selection of recipes for muggles who hunger for a taste of England. Dishing out recipes that all muggle readers ought to try at least once in their lives. This cookbook deserves a place in every muggle kitchen. A brave new world of gustatory delights awaits if only we Americans have the stomach to try something other than our favorite dishes of pizza burgers, and sandwiches. I raise my foaming mug of butterbeer, the most frequently mentioned beverage in the Harry Potter novels, in salute to Dinah, who serves up more than 150 recipes that will satisfy the appetites of hungry muggles everywhere. 
Anyone for toad in the hole? Kakaliki, haggis, or goulash? Step right this way. Hey, where do you think you're going? Come back. Just try one bite. For the gastronomically conservative reader who is willing to venture forth and broaden his palate with traditional British dishes, the unofficial Harry Potter cookbook will satisfy the appetite, no matter how persnickety. Bon Appetit, George Bim, author of Muggles and Magic and Fact and Fiction and Folklore in Harry Potter's World. Chapter 3 Treats from the Train Harry Potter is very worried. His ticket says he must board the 11 o'clock train to Hogwarts from platform 9 and 3 quarters at King Cross Station. But as his Uncle Vernon sneeringly points out before stomping away and leaving Harry alone, there is no such thing as platform 9 and 3 quarters. Imagine Harry's surprise when he discovers that the platform is something you do. You lean against the barrier between platform 9 and 10 and fall through to see the shiny red steam engine called the Hogwarts Express, belching smoke into the morning air. Harry is one lucky chap to get to travel to school in a steam engine. The shiny red steam engines of the past had beautiful cars with carved wooden seats and handsome wooden paneling on the walls. But this particular one had something even better. A food cart that sold unusual sweets such as cauldron cakes and pumpkin pasties. Harry enjoys buying stacks of the cauldron cakes, piles of the pumpkin pasties, and mountains of the chocolate frogs to share with his friends. Pumpkin Pasties to Harry's surprise, the snacks, the snack witch on the Hogwarts Express isn't selling health bars or Doritos. For the first time in his life, Harry pulls out some money and buys as many treats as he wants, which include pumpkin pasties. Imagine biting into a pasty only to discover you've just chomped down on a whole bird, skin and bones and all. Yuck. But in the Middle Ages, huge, too tough to eat pasties enclosed whole birds or whole beef roasts. Today, the most common pasty in the Cornish pasty, but in Cyprus, a pasty filled with pumpkin and crushed wheat is a popular treat. Pasty crust. One, one fourth cups all purpose flour, one tablespoon granulated sugar, one fourth teaspoon salt, Five tablespoons cold butter cut into chunks. Three tablespoons vegetable shortening chilled and cut into chunks. Four to six tablespoons ice water. Filling. One cup canned pumpkin, not pumpkin pie filling. One fourth cup granulated sugar. One eighth teaspoon ground nutmeg. One eighth teaspoon ground cinnamon. Place the flour, sugar, and salt in the bowl of a food processor. Pulse a few times to combine. Scatter the butter and shortening over the flour mixture. Pulse about 15 minutes until the mixture resembles coarse yellow meal with no white powdery bits remaining. 2. Transfer the mixture into a large mixing bowl. Sprinkle 4 tablespoons of cold water over the mixture. Toss the mixture together with a spatula until it starts clumping together. If it's too dry, add more water, one tablespoon at a time. Better too wet than too dry. Gather the dough into a ball and pat it into a disc. Wrap it in plastic wrap and refrigerate for at least one hour. 
Combine the pumpkin, sugar, nutmeg, and cinnamon in a mixing bowl. Mix well. Preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Roll out the dough one, in one eighth inch thick. Use a saucer to cut out six inch circles. Four, put two to three tablespoons of filling in the center of each circle of dough. Moisten the edges with water, fold the dough over the filling, and crimp with a fork to seal the edges. Cut slits to make vents. Bake on an ungreased cookie sheet for 30 minutes or until browned. Makes six pasties. Pumpkin juice. What could be worse than missing the train and having to fly your father's car to school? Eating sweets for hours and then realizing you have nothing with which to wash it down. Although crashing into a murderous tree probably ranks up there as well. After finishing the bag of toffees Harry and Ron find in the car, Harry is so thirsty he starts fantasizing about the pumpkin juice he could buy if he were on the Hogwarts Express. It's unsurprising that witches, or wizards in this case, would drink pumpkin juice. During the fall harvest, the Celts used to carve vegetable lanterns out of turnips and rutabagas to scare away e evil spirits. Later, Americans started using pumpkins to the same tradition. The pumpkin lanterns eventually became associated with Halloween, perhaps of its connection with witches and demons and vampires and such like. One small pumpkin, known as sugar pumpkin or pie pumpkin. Two cups apple juice, one cup white grape juice, one cup pineapple juice. Preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Slice the pumpkin in half, pole to pole, and scoop out the seeds. Don't worry about the stringy fibers. They are hard to remove and won't affect the results. Place the pumpkin halves face down on a baking sheet and roast 45 minutes to one hour until soft. Remove from the oven. When the pumpkin is cool enough to handle, scoop out the flesh and discard the skin. Place the cooked pumpkin in a large fine mesh sieve. Set it over a bowl and push the pumpkin through using a rubber spatula. Scrape and mash as you push. It will take several minutes. Discard the pulpy mass left in the sieve. Stir the sieved pumpkin in the bowl to evenly distribute the juices, and then measure out one cup. Place the cup of sieved pumpkin in a pitcher along with the apple juice, grape juice, and pineapple juice. Stir vigorously until the pumpkin is completely dispersed. Chill the juice until it's very cold. Before serving, stir the juice well, as the pumpkin will settle to the bottom. Fill crystal goblets with ice cubes and pour the juice over the ice. Mix five cups. Although this recipe was tested using freshly roasted pumpkin, it would probably work if you use canned pumpkin instead to save the bother of making it from scratch. Chapter 6 Breakfast Before Class Breakfast is not just an important meal for muggles, it's important for wizards, too. But it's especially important at Hogwarts because that's when the owls arrive to deliver letters and packages from home. The flood of owls can be a bit much if you're receiving fan mail or hate mail, like Hermione after she was written up in a newspaper by reporter Rita Skeeter in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Or like Harry after he gave his fateful interview in Harry Potter in the Order of the Phoenix. How many different foods do you eat for breakfast every morning? One or two maybe? A bowl of cereal? A muffin and hot chocolate if you have the time? Pancakes and sausages if someone loves you very much? Or it's a holiday? If you don't completely skip this important meal, then how about a breakfast of bacon and eggs? Sausages, fried bread, fried tomatoes, 
fried mushrooms, kippers, black pudding, baked beans and toast and marmalade. Oh, and don't forget the porridge with cream and treacle. What an enormous amount of food for breakfast. But that's the traditional English breakfast for you. In the 1700s, the upper classes, and later also the Victorian middle class, were served all of that and more. This heavy-duty meal is also called the full English fry-up. But today, our cousins across the ocean eat much the same things that we do. Plain old cereal, or a muffin and coffee in the morning. But not to worry, you die-hard Harry Potter fans can still find the traditional Fry up at some Brit British hotels and bed and breakfasts if you ever travel to England. In the Great Hall, we find a mix of the traditional and modern. Some mornings find Harry eating humdrum cereal, but other mornings he enjoys toast and marmalade, porridge with treacle, kippers, sausages, or fried tomatoes. This chapter does not include a recipe for toast, although Victorian cookbooks devoted chapters to the art of making toast properly. Today, with toasters and toaster ovens, it's pretty simple if you just pay attention. If you don't want to make your own marmalade, you can find this favorite toppings for toast next to the jams and jellies in your local, local supermarket. Treacle, or golden syrup, can be found at a specialty food store in some supermarkets, or you can substitute maple syrup, light molasses, or corn syrup. English Farmhouse Scrambled Eggs and Bacon Gilderoy Lockhart can't seem to stop embarrassing Harry, whether it's before the start of term on the first day of classes, when eggs and bacon are served for breakfast in the Great Hall, Poor Harry, the forced breakfast chef at the Dursleys, also serves bacon and eggs on Dudley's birthday, after being warned he'd better not burn it. Who doesn't enjoy eggs with bacon on a weekend morning when there's actually time to make it and eat it? Feel like you're at home with Harry, with this centuries-old breakfast classic. Throw in fried tomatoes with toast and a bowl of porridge to pretend you're eating the traditional English breakfast, which contains too much food for normal people to eat, even occasionally. Two sliced bacon, diced, two large eggs, one tablespoon milk or heavy cream, salt and pepper to taste, one ounce English cheddar cheese shredded. Heat a skillet over medium-high heat. Add the diced bacon to the pan. Cook, stirring occasionally until it reaches desired crispiness. Break the eggs into a small bowl and beat with a fork until completely combined. Add the milk or cream and stir to combine. Add the salt and pepper and stir to combine. Pour the egg mixture over the cooked bacon in the pan and as soon as they begin to set, become cooked. Stir with a wooden spoon, moving them around and over until completely cooked. Spoon the eggs into a plate and topped with the shredded cheddar cheese makes one serving. Sweet Orange Marmalade Marmalade shows up often in the Harry Potter books. It's just that British. In one breakfast scene, Hermione determinedly avoids discussing her busy schedule and asks for the marmalade in response to Ron's questions. How's this for sweet little story? A Scottish, a Scottish merchant brought his wife a load of bitter Seville oranges, not very edible. Instead of saying, why do you expect me to do with these? As an ordinary housewife might have done, she marched into the kitchen to experiment, and thus orange marmalade was born. Three oranges, two cups sugar, two cups water. Place the oranges in a medium saucepan and cover with water. Bring to a boil. 
Then reduce to a simmer and cook for one and a half hours. Remove the oranges from the pot to a cutting board. Discard the cooking water and rinse the pot. Peel the oranges and scrape off the pith, the white underside of the peel, using a metal spoon. Discard the pith as it's bitter. Mince the orange peel and add to the clean pot. Chop the peeled oranges, discard the pits, and process in a blender or food processor until smooth. Pour through a sieve, pressing down with a rubber spatula to extract as much juice as possible. Discard the pulp and add the juice to the pot, along with the sugar and water. As the mixture boils, it will expand like crazy, so make sure your pot is large enough to handle at least double what you're putting in. Cook the mixture over medium-high heat, stirring constantly until the sugar is dissolved and it begins to bubble. Clip a candy thermometer to the side of the pot and continue cooking, stirring constantly until the mixture registers 220 degrees Fahrenheit on the candy thermometer. Remove from the heat. Mix enough to fill one 14 ounce jar. Cinnamon Pull Apart Breakfast Rolls To deflect questions about what Jenny was about to tell Harry, Percy, man, he was a guilty conscience, asks for the breakfast rolls. But Jenny was about to tell Harry something much, much more important. Good thing Percy interrupted, or she would have spoiled the plot. Cinnamon rolls, or buns, are a classic breakfast treat. Most people don't know this, but the cinnamon you buy is more likely powdered cassia bark, which tastes like cinnamon and is more plentiful and therefore cheaper. Real cinnamon is said to be superior, but who would know? Dough. One fourth cup warm water, one tablespoon, one packet active dry yeast, one tablespoon granulated sugar, two third cup whole milk, half stick, butter, three cups all purpose flour, half teaspoon salt, two large eggs, third cup granulated sugar, cinnamon feeling, one tablespoon butter melted, one fourth packed dark brown sugar, one tablespoon cinnamon. Icing, one cup confectioner sugar sifted, four ounces cream cheese softened, one tablespoon heavy cream, half teaspoon pure vanilla extract. Cinnamon pull apart breakfast rolls continued. Combine the water, yeast, and one tablespoon sugar in a mixing bowl and set aside until puffy. Heat the milk and butter in a small saucepan or the microwave until the butter is melted. Set aside. Whisk together the flour and salt. Set aside. In a separate bowl, whisk together the eggs and sugar, then whisk in the milk-butter mixture. Add the yeast mixture and egg mixture to the flour mixture and stir to combine. If making the dough by hand, First whisk half a cup of the flour mixture into the egg mixture until smooth. Then add the egg mixture to the rest of the flour mixture. Knead the dough in the mixing bowl of an electric mixer fitted with a dough hook or by hand, either in the bowl or on a lightly floured surface until the dough is smoothed and elastic. About 10 minutes. Place in an oiled bowl, turning the coat and cover with plastic wrap Set aside in a warm place until doubled in size. One and a half to two hours. Grease and flour a nine inch by 13 inch pan. Turn the dough out onto a lightly floured surface and roll into a 16 inch by 12 inch rectangle. Brush the tablespoon of melted butter over the dough. 
Combine the brown sugar and cinnamon and spread it over the dough until within half inch of the borders. Roll up the long slide. Slice off the messy ends. The best way to cut the roll is using dental floss. Sounds crazy, but a knife exerts too much pressure and squashes the roll. First, slide a length of floss onto the roll until you reach the center. Bring the two ends over the roll and cross them, pulling until a neat cut has been made. In this manner, cut the two halves in half again. Then, each quarter into three slices to make 12 rolls in all. Lay the rolls in the prepared pan and leave to rise until the rolls are touching each other and reach the rim one and a half to two hours. Adjust the oven rack to the middle position and preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Bake the rolls for 20 minutes until golden brown, rotating the pan halfway through baking. Remove from the oven. Cool for 10 minutes in the pan. Then invert the pan and re-invert the rolls onto a serving platter. To make the icing, beat the icing ingredients together with a wooden spoon until smooth. Be sure to sift the confectioner's sugar or you will have lumps. Spread the icing over the rolls while they are still warm. Or pipe the frosting using a number three round tip. Eat immediately. The, ro the rolls do not keep well and should be eaten within a few hours of being made. Makes 12 rolls. If you want the rolls for breakfast, prepare the rolls the day before through step three. But instead of setting them to rise, cover the rolls with plastic wrap and allow them to rise in the refrigerator overnight. Then pop them in the oven in the morning. You can also prepare the icing ahead of time and keep it in the refrigerator. Just allow it to come to room temperature before using. Chapter 8. Desserts and Snacks at School The British are a nation of sugar fiends. So are the Americans, but that's another story. So much so that in early times, without dental care like we have today, their teeth rotted and fell out. You really would have not have wanted to see them smile. The peasants, ironically, had healthier teeth because sugar was too expensive for them. Pudding is the English word for dessert, and the pudding king was George I. He insisted he be served Christmas pudding, although Oliver Cromwell had banned it because, one, it was too sinfully rich. True, especially if you're trying to lose weight. And two, it echoed pagan Celtic customs. Also true. The flaming pudding represented the fires the Druids and Celts lit at the winter solstice to strengthen the sun. Here are some of the quaintly named sweets they ate. And I'm sure I'll butcher some of these titles, so forgive me. Frumenti, a pudding of wheat kernels cooked in milk and sweetened. It was served at King Henry IV's wedding feast. Not the Henry with the six wives, that's Henry the eighth. Flumery, an oatmeal dish that evolved into a blank mage type of jelly made with cream or ground almonds. Junket, a sweetened curd cheese. None of these dishes appear in the Harry Potter books. It's just an interesting bit of info. Of course, the British have also been eating apple pies and custards for eons. So it's no surprise that the desserts at Hogwarts follow the fine English tradition of being sweet, yummy, and unwholesome. The lucky students get fancy desserts on golden platters with each meal. These recipes are fun to make, even more fun to eat, and are okay to have as long as you save them for special occasions. Lemon Drops 
With Harry, it's often a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But when another student is attacked and Harry is yet again found at the scene of the crime, Professor McGonagall decides enough is enough. This is something for Professor Dumbledore to handle. The password to his quarters is Lemon Drop. No surprise there, as he confessed to Professor McGonagall that he was fond of this muggle sweet. Lemon Drops, as you might expect, are lemon-flavored candies. They are basically the same as acid drops, a more sour candy, just prepared with lemon extract instead of citric acid. In England, there's a popular sweet called a sherbet lemon, which is a lemon-flavored sucking candy with sherbet powder in the center. But specialized equipment is needed to produce it. One-fourth cup water, one cup granulated sugar, half cup light corn syrup, one-fourth teaspoon cream of tartar, one teaspoon lemon extract. Line two baking sheets with parchment paper and set aside. Combine the water, sugar, corn syrup, and cream of tartar in a small saucepan. Cook over medium-high, stirring constantly until the sugar is dissolved and the mixture begins to bubble. Wash down the sides of the pan with a pastry brush dipped in hot water if sugar crystals have formed on the sides. Clip a candy thermometer to the pan and continue cooking over medium-high, stirring occasionally until the mixture reaches 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Remove the pan from the heat. Stir in the lemon extract. When the bubbling has subsided, use an oiled teaspoon to drop teaspoons of the sugar syrup onto the prepared sheets. To store the candies, wrap them in sheets of parchment paper, making sure the candies don't touch as they will stick to each other. Makes about 40 candies. Jam Donuts. The whole ordeal is over. The monster behind the mysterious attacks has been destroyed. By Harry Potter, of course. And Harry's good name, as well as Hagrid's, is restored. The feast following Harry's recuperation is one of the best he's ever seen. And life just gets better when Her Professor Dumbledore announces while Ron eats a jam donut that Lockhart is leaving for good. Do oily cakes sound appetizing? Well, that's what the Dutch settlers called them. When they introduced these little fried cakes in America. In England, when most people celebrate Pancake Day, the residents of the town of Baldock, about 30 miles north of London, celebrate their own version called Donut Day. In England, the most popular type of donut has no hole and is filled with jam. Half a cup warm water, four and a half teaspoons dry yeast, one tablespoon granulated sugar, one stick butter, one cup whole milk, two large eggs, five cups all-purpose flour, two-third cup granulated sugar, one and a half teaspoons of salt, four cups peanut oil, Raspberry jam for filling. Confectioner's sugar for dusting. Combine the water, yeast, and one tablespoon sugar in a mixing bowl and let it stand until the yeast is dissolved and the mixture is puffy. Heat the butter and milk in the microwave or in a small saucepan over low heat until the butter is melted. Whisk the eggs into the milk mixture. In the bowl of an electric mixer, combine the flour, sugar, and salt. Whisk together the milk and yeast mixture and pour it into the flour mixture. Attack the dough hook and knead the dough on the slowest speed for about 10 minutes. After the first few minutes, the dough should clean the sides of the bowl. If the dough is very sticky, add more flour, one-fourth cup at a time. 
Remove the dough from the mixture and knead it for 30 seconds on a lightly dusted surface. You can also knead the dough by hand, either in the bowl or on a floured surface. Transfer the dough to an oiled bowl, turning to coat the dough on all sides. Cover the dough with plastic wrap and leave it to rise in a warm, draft-free place, about one and a half to two hours, until doubled in size. Remove the dough from the bowl and roll it out half inch thick on a floured surface. Cut circles of dough with a three inch cutter. Cut the remaining scraps into three inch pieces. Place the dough circles and scraps on a piece of floured parchment paper and leave them to rise for one and a half to two hours until doubled in size. Line two or three baking sheets with four layers of paper towels. Clip a candy thermometer onto a four quart pot and pour in the peanut oil. Heat the oil over medium flame until the thermometer registers 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Or a piece of bread dropped in the oil bubbles instantly, but doesn't turn dark brown right away. Carefully place three or four donuts into the oil. Fry until golden, about one to one and a half minutes per side. Bring the temperature back up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit between batches. Transfer the donuts with a metal slotted, with a metal slotted spatula, to the paper towel lined baking sheets. Repeat until all the donuts and scraps are fried. Sift the confectioner's sugar generously over the warm donuts. When the donuts are cool, fill a pastry bag fitted with a plain metal tip with the jam. Plunge the tip into the bottom of each donut and squirt in a small amount of jam. Makes about one and a half dozen donuts. If you plan to make these donuts often, it is worthwhile to invest $5 in a flavor injector, the kind with a sharp needle-like squirter. If you use one of these, plunge the needle tip through the sides. It will leave a barely detectable hole. Chocolate Eclairs. To show his gratitude to Dobby for the gillyweed that saved him in the second task, Harry descends to the Hogwarts kitchens where Dobby works to give him a pair of socks, Dobby's favorite gift. In the kitchen, Hermione is disgusted by Ron's greed. Why he's asking for Eclairs when he's just had breakfast is beyond her. But the house elves are delighted to present him with a huge platter full. Eclair comes from the French word for lightning, but how it's related to this yummy dessert is anybody's guess. Perhaps it's because it disappears as quickly as lightning. Pastry. One cup water. Half stick butter. One fourth teaspoon salt. One tablespoon granulated sugar one cup all-purpose flour, four large eggs, pastry bag for forming eclairs, chocolate pastry cream, one cup whole milk, half cup heavy cream or whole milk, one tablespoon cornstarch, one tablespoon unsweetened cocoa powder, half cup granulated sugar, pinch of salt, three large egg yolks, one teaspoon pure vanilla extract, Two ounces bittersweet chocolate, chopped. Two tablespoons butter, only if using all milk. Chocolate glaze. Half cup heavy cream. Six ounces bittersweet chocolate, chopped. For the shoe pastry, combine the water, butter, salt, and sugar in a small saucepan and bring to a boil. Reduce the heat and add the flour all at once, mixing quickly with a wooden spoon until the mixture pulls away from the sides of the pot and forms a ball around the spoon. Transfer the dough to the bowl of a stand mix mixer and allow it to cool slightly. Add the eggs one at a time, 
beating after each one combined and scraping down the sides of the bowl. Preheat the oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit and grease and flour a baking sheet. Cut a one and one half inch slit at the edge of a disposable pastry bag and fill it with shoe paste. Pipe three inch logs onto the baking sheet in two rows of six or seven each. Bake for 15 minutes, rotating the baking sheet halfway through the baking time. Reduce the heat to 375 degrees Fahrenheit and bake another 20 minutes, again rotating halfway through the baking time until the eclairs are puffed and golden. It's better to overbake than to underbake, as the eclairs will collapse and be impossible to fill if they are underbaked. Remove them from the oven and cool to room temperature. After they are cooled, the shells can be sealed in an airtight container or zipper bag and frozen for two months. They should not be unwrapped until they are completely defrosted or they will turn soggy from the condensation. To make the pastry cream, combine the milk, heavy cream if using, cornstarch, cocoa powder, sugar, and salt in a medium saucepan and cook over medium heat high, stirring constantly until the hot but not bubbling. Reduce the heat, slowly pour half cup of the hot mixture into the egg yolks. While whisking constantly, then pour the egg yolk mixture into the saucepan while stirring constantly. Return the heat to medium high and cook, stirring constantly until the mixture is thick and bubbling. Remove from the heat. Add the vanilla and chocolate and butter if using all milk. Stir to combine. Pour the mixture through a sieve, using a rubber spatula to push it through. Cover the surface directly with plastic wrap to prevent a skin from forming, and cool to room temperature. Refrigerate until cold, or up to two days. To make the glaze, combine the cream and chocolate in a microwave-safe bowl. Microwave on high for two minutes, stopping the microwave and stirring every 30 seconds. Then stir until smooth, Cool until it is thick enough to spread. To assemble the eclairs, split them in half with a knife. Fill the bottom halves with about two tablespoons of the pastry cream. Replace the top halves and spread with about two tea teaspoons of the glaze. Allow the glaze to set. Eclairs are best eaten right away after the glaze is set. They can be refrigerated for a few days, but they will be a bit soggy. Makes 12 to 14. Shoe pastry is a sticky dough used to make cream puffs and eclairs, among other baked or fried goods, such as beignets. Shoe comes from the French word for cabbage, and is so named because it was used in France to make little cakes that looked like cabbages. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Quiet the Elk. As you can see, my candle didn't last very long, but there's still a little bit going. Thank you again for listening. I hope this was relaxing and you're able to catch up on some much needed sleep. And I'll see you all in the next episode. Thank you. <laughs>